You guys ready? All right. So um, today uh, I'm going to be speaking to you about normal sleep. And we'll go in and describe what normal sleep is. Um, and uh, we'll go over its mechanism. Uh, the reason I chose this topic is I wanted to set a foundation for further uh, lectures. Uh, as you all know, Dr. Kassab wants us to give 10 lectures a year. So um, we, we, we've got to make sure that we plan ahead and have enough material for, for his invitation. <laughs> so um, the objectives today, um, is we are going to be describing uh, the, the, what the normal sleep requirements are throughout the human lifespan. We'll be talking about the neurophysiological basis of sleep regulation and the mechanisms of transition between types uh, and stages of sleep and wakefulness. We will briefly uh, have an overview of the control of breathing and over upper airways during sleep. And um, we will be also uh, talking about the relationship between neurochemistry uh, and physiology in terms of sleep and uh, systemic uh, physiology. So this is just so, so you have an, a little bit of a historical uh, context, uh, context uh, before the, the Neanderthals uh, roamed uh, the earth uh, more than 20 to 70,000 years uh, ago. Uh, it, it is said that humans or, or human, uh, uh, human uh, predecessors were uh, polyphasic individuals. And we have evidence, uh, including from, from genetics uh, that have been correlated to our, our own human gene. Um, specific genes that are, are related to circadian regulation that have led the anthropologists to, to determine that the that Neanderthals were likely the first uh, creatures that developed a monophasic sleep. And that's still a little bit uh, for, up for debate, particularly on those who like to nap. Um, we see over the years that many civilizations uh, have been very preoccupied about sleep. Uh, about disturbed sleep, about trying to sleep. Um, and we see uh, more emergence uh, shortly before uh, uh, 1000 to 5000 BC of, of rituals that uh, people uh, got into to, to promote sleep and, and better, better rest. Uh, by the time that, that Aristotle was around in 400 BC, it was thought that uh, sleep was an arrest of consciousness in the heart. At that point, consciousness was believed to be uh, the, something that was um, seated in the heart, which Galen uh, challenged by 162, um, making the declaration that it's actually uh, the brain, the seat of consciousness. Um, Maimonides in 1180, he was, uh, if you're familiar with him, he was a Sephardi Jew, physician, rabbi, and philosopher who, who in his writings described that we're supposed to be uh, having one single shot at an eight hour or a third of the day uh, for sleep, which is, uh, he guesstimated, but he's, he was quite accurate on that. Um, in this, in, by 1729 um, uh, comes the enlightenment and the, the, the interest in, in scientific uh, uh, method uh, application of, of a lot of things, including sleep. And Jean-Jacques Doctois uh, did some, some experiments in uh, mimosis, which he, this, these are flowers, if you know them, the yellow flowers that open during the day and close at night. So he took them out of uh, any kind of light stimulation and he saw that these plants had uh, kept their patterns, that they have intrinsic circadian rhythms, which eventually led to the, the, the uh, science of circadian um, uh, sleep science and, and discovery that we have uh, intrinsic circadian rhythms as well. Um, interestingly, the, 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 uh, the what I found out about mimosas is that they're yellow and that's why the drink mimosa is called mimosa because essentially it's a, it has the, the, the color of the flower of the plant. Um, and uh, uh, Rich, Nathaniel Kleidman, he was a Russian uh, immigrant uh, who's considered the father of sleep. Um, sometime um, uh, in uh, 1938, they went to the mammoth uh, cave in Kentucky and they spent their 32 nights in complete uh, light absence and they attempted to adapt to a 28 hour uh, uh, circadian rhythm. Um, what they found out, Richardson was, his, uh, was younger, he was uh, a resident or a trainee, um, and he was able to adapt, but, but Kleidman just kept his own uh, 24 uh, 
and change the circadian clock. And, and, and from that, um, eventually more further research uh, led to defining that our typical circadian rhythm is a little bit more than 24 hours. Uh, it, it obviously, is, there's a lot of individual variability um, and we depend on environmental uh, site givers or, or clues to uh, keep us entrained to a 24 uh, hour cycle so we don't progressively keep delaying. Um, and this is important to understand when we talk in the future about circadian rhythm disorders. In 1952, the, I think EEG was invented in 1924. By 1952, uh, also Kleitman and one of his uh, uh, trainees, William Demont, uh, made some observations and EEG correlations that led to the discovery and description of, of REM sleep, uh, both by observational as well as a polysomnographic uh, criteria. The uh, RNK uh, criteria uh, are the criteria that were developed in 1968 and they have been slightly changed since, uh, but these are the criteria that we use for sleep staging. And, and ever since then, there's been all sorts of advances in genetics and circadian uh, uh, pharmacology. It's a great uh, time to be in sleep because it, it is truly a new and, and, and blossoming science that we're, we're, we're just seeing the beginning uh, of, of, of what it can, um, can, can, can reveal in terms of, of, of many, many things, in terms of, of, of disease, in terms of uh, diseases of the brain, as well as systemic uh, pathology. So if we're gonna to talk to about normal sleep, what are our expectations? What is sleep in, in layman's terms? There's many definitions, but, but in, simplest, in the simplest terms, um, it's a natural, it's periodic, it's a reversible behavioral state of perceptual disengagement and unresponsiveness uh, to the environment. Um, we have very minimal movement. We have uh, some uh, stereotypical postures like curling and, and the, the state is reversible and, and there is a reduced response to stimulation. So that's also why, why so why do we sleep? What do we need sleep? Um, well, the, 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 the function of sleep is still up for debate, but we know in general that it is important for body and brain tissue restoration. Um, during sleep, uh, waste clearance of CNS uh, products uh, happens through, a, through the lymphatic system. Uh, sleep is very important for energy conservation and adaptation, as well as memory reinforcement and consolidation. Um, a lot of it happens by uh, pruning and selection of, of synapses that are favored and others that are pruned uh, during uh, normal sleep. Uh, to, to help us with consolidation of memory and, and prepare our brains for new learning. Uh, and, in, and also sleep uh, is uh, tightly involved in, in, in thermal regulation. So, so that is why we sleep. So, so normal sleep, essentially, anything that deviates from that, it's not, it's not supposed to be normal. But a good night's sleep is when you, you fall asleep easily, you do not fully, awake, uh, fully wake up during the night, you do not wake up too early and you feel refreshed, simple. So if any of those things are happening, there's, there's an issue that you need to um, try to uh, investigate. Um, these are the typical durations. Uh, for, uh, as you see, the, the, the uh, required sleep amounts decrease as we age, but by the age uh, of 18, um, the amount is pretty much uh, consistent, uh, maybe the requirements uh, drop a little bit in older adults over the age of 65 to, to seven to eight hours instead of seven to nine hours. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people that are older that go come to your office and have all sorts of problems. They have a large prostate, they, they're on 20 medications, you know, they, they have all sorts of environmental interruptions and they, uh, well, you know, I'm just older and, and, and there, there is an expectation uh, in the elderly that don't sleep enough that that is normal. And that's also something that, that I frequently find myself trying to dispel. Uh, the, the different stages from wake to REM sleep uh, on, on, on the wake uh, stage, uh, what we'll see in, in EEG and uh, polysomnography uh, is presence of an alpha occipital predominant rhythm. We see a high chin tone. Uh, we see high rapid eye movements uh, as we move into stage one sleep. We see uh, a reduction of the amplitude and, uh, and we start seeing emergence of mixed frequency EEGs, vertex waves and slow eye movements uh, in a normal sleep cycle. We go into stage two after that, where we see 
emergence of K-complexes and sleep spindles, uh, and then into slow wave sleep, which predominates during the first uh, half of the night where we are going to see predominantly uh, delta waves. Uh, it used to be separated before between three and four, depending on the density of those uh, delta waves, but now uh, slow wave sleep is just, uh, is just characterized into one uh, stage. And then we have REM sleep, where we have presence of rapid eye movements and, 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 and typical atonia, which is an important uh, uh, fact to know when we are trying to understand conditions such as uh, narcolepsy uh, and maybe even REM sleep behavior disorder. This is uh, what we call a hypnogram, which essentially uh, shows what a, a normal sleep architecture uh, ideally should look like. And as you can see, you start from awake, you go to two, three, uh, slow wave sleep, and then you cycle uh, through REM sleep. Uh, this is still with the old classification of stage three and four. You go through REM sleep and then you, then you circle again and you go through this cycle four or five times. As we progress through the night, the REM uh, periods become longer and longer. The non-REM periods become shorter. Uh, and, and, and then um, the, the sleep efficiency is, 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 decreases as we play, pay our, our sleep debt um, as we approach uh, the time that we need to wake up. So just some, some quickly uh, show you some, so how, how this looks like for you all, the, for, for those of you that read EEGs, you would notice that the, there are 30 seconds in this page and things look kind of compressed. This is the typical epoch of a PSG, but we have a limited, limited number of EEG leads. We can put more whenever we want to, whenever we're, we have people in the lab that are being considered for nocturnal uh, seizures, uh, we can add a few. Uh, frontal and, and, and temporal leads to evaluate that, but the first two channels are left and right up outer cantus that's designed to measure eye movements. Um, the third one is, is the chin, it's, a, it's essentially it's a, it's an EMG of the chin, um, important uh, when we're trying to uh, define REM sleep. Uh, in the, on the EEG you see on those four channels, you see that there is uh, it's an awake state, so you see predominance of a, a posterior uh, alpha rhythm. You don't have a, a, a laser, do you? Or, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll start, you know, jumping up and down like oh, those old Beatles. So you remember those Beatles songs? I don't know if you're, some of you are not old enough to remember, but the Beatles had some cartoons that had these bouncing ball where you will sing along. Uh, anyway, um, that's what I would do if I had the laser. So, okay, so take the laser away. And then we have an EKG lead. We have limb leads, one on each leg. Important to uh, look at uh, per things like periodic limb movement disorders of sleep. And then we have the respiratory channels uh, below from the oximetry below uh, to abdominal and thoracic uh, 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 belts that measure chest movement and, and an oronasal uh, thermistor, which is a, 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 a thermally uh, uh, mediated uh, uh, sensor of flow. And then we have a snore channel. Of course, this guy is awake, so he's not snoring. Then um, we go into M1 here. You see, you start seeing the slow wave. He's getting drowsy. You start seeing mixed frequency. You lose the, the alpha background. You start losing a little bit of the chin uh, tone on the EMG. Uh, after this, you typically see N2, where you see the emergence of uh, sleep spindles and vertex wet. Uh, um, K complexes and, and vertex waves, which you start seeing from N1, um, and you still see some slow eye movements. This is uh, to illustrate a, a transition from N2 to wake. You can see uh, after the third, uh, after the second uh, magenta colored uh, box, there's a change in the frequency from you see before then, you see uh, eye movements, you see K complexes, you see sleep spindles, and then there's an arousal where you see. Uh, uh, an increase in EMG tone, and you see a change to a posterior alpha rhythm, you also get a clue from the, from the limbs uh, down uh, where, where they start, start moving as well as this person wakes up. Uh, N3 uh, or, or slow wave sleep, you see basically there's predominance of, of slow waves, of delta waves. This is an example of a transition from N3 or slow wave sleep, which you see maybe for the first uh, 17 seconds uh, or, or less of that page, um, you see the slow waves uh, transitioning into a more lower uh, frequency mixed 
lower frequency uh, with sawtooth waves. That's another characteristic of REM sleep. You see the rapid eye movements where the number three is, and you see where number one is that there's a change, change in EMG tone. And that's uh, actually an essential criteria of REM sleep that you have to see that REM atonia uh, to, in order to, to diagnose it. And again, loss of that REM atonia is, is, is pathophysiologically uh, important. This is uh, of somebody who's in REM. You see clearly the rapid eye movements on the top. You see there's no chin tone and where the star is, you see the EMG chin tone picks up. Uh, he is going to end one because the following epoch was still sleep. It, this was not, not really an arousal. He didn't go back to an alpha rhythm. Um, this is all REM. You see the slow, the, the rapid eye movements. You see the, the, the typical uh, EEG low uh, amplitude mixed frequency, uh, uh, lower, low, five to seven hertz of frequencies there. So during, uh, as we age, and we will see on the, on the PSG that uh, a lot of things stay the same, some, some change, but REM latency, sleep onset latency, uh, they do not change. We do see some decrease in sleep efficiency as we age in uh, uh, slow wave sleep uh, amounts and in REM sleep. And we also therefore uh, see an increase in N1 and N2 sleep. So, so what we see essentially is that as we get older, our sleep becomes lighter. And whether that's normal or not, it's, 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 it's proposed that maybe it is, maybe it's not, but there's so many things that we accumulate, so many chronic conditions that we accumulate as we age uh, that become uh, sources of pharmacologic or environmental or, or other physical uh, reasons uh, for sleep interruption. Women have less change than men uh, and the delta uh, sleep amplitude um, or, or the amplitude of the slow wave sleeps uh, uh, it stays the same. This is uh, uh, the hours. This, these are essentially surveys of self-reported sleep amounts. And we see how they uh, decreased as uh, we approach uh, our elderly years. So now that we, that we talked about what sleep is, why we sleep and, and uh, how we measure sleep, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit of the mechanisms of sleep. So essentially, Normal sleep has uh, two mechanisms. Uh, first is the, what we call the process S or the homeostatic sleep drive. And essentially this means that for every minute we are awake, we accumulate more and more sleep debt. Uh, that's uh, uh, driven by accumulation of toxic waste compounds in the brain, mainly adenosine, which is uh, the basis for caffeine, which is that adenosine uh, blocker. Um, as we approach uh, the night and it starts getting uh, darker, the, that homeostatic sleep drive keeps increasing at the same time during the day, uh, there's stimulation of sleep centers that lead uh, to uh, low melatonin levels. And as uh, light is gradually uh, being reduced, we approach uh, a typical bedtime that in the average adult, maybe somewhere around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, again, with a lot of individual variation, but ideally these two processes the, the major sleep drive. And when you have the body temperature in the deer and the start of the increase of, of the melatonin uh, a, a curve, um, it's when you ideally want to uh, time uh, your sleep for, for optimal sleep efficiency. Uh, this is genetically determined. This varies uh, uh, from person to person. You can even uh, uh, plot your own dim light uh, melatonin onset curve by having blood drawn every hour on the hour for 24 hours and measuring the levels and creating a plot. And that could, uh, you know, that's, the, that's in the future of, of sleep medicine, better understanding by, via genetics and, and serology of what our chronotypes are, because it's important that as much as we can, we, we, we uh, take occupations, we, we, we live, um, if we can, uh, with a circadian uh, system that aligns well with what our body requires or uh, recognize that when you can't do that, there are ways that you can intervene to adapt. And that's uh, some, some more of a topic for uh, when we discuss circadian rhythm disorders. And then as you see, the melatonin uh, stays high as, as, the, as, as the morning approaches and the light starts coming out, the melatonin starts, level starts dropping down, uh, the nosing and other waste compounds are removed uh, via the lymphatic system, and then we're awake and the whole 
uh, cycle repeats itself again. And uh, I would say uh, that um, the, 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 there is uh, some that say that there is like one a phase uh, of, 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 of a slight peak of, of, of homeostatic sleep drive increase uh, right between 1 and 2 p.m., which is very interesting because I'm giving a sleep lecture exactly at 1 p.m. So if, you, if any of you fall asleep, then you can, you can point to the slide. So um, this is uh, a slide to show the uh, key, uh, the key uh, players in uh, our circadian system. We have light that is uh, essentially our main uh, uh, side giver uh, that projects uh, into the retina and through the retinal hypothalamic tract back to the uh, suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus, uh, which is in charge of modulating uh, melatonin production depending on the time. Uh, there are uh, circadian oscillators, uh, oscillating neurons uh, there. We don't, we don't understand fully how they work, um, but at, at a certain time and um, at the, the, during the day when uh, we eliminate the light stimuli, uh, we have the temperature nadir as we are approaching uh, sleep, the, uh, the messaging from the suprachiasmatic nucleus to the VLPO, which is the ventrolateral posterior uh, uh, nucleus of the hypothalamus, which is where the, the, the switch the, the wake sleep switches, uh, it, it gets turned on and then we have the onset of sleep. Uh, there are important uh, connections to the hippocampus that are, uh, and the temporal lobes that are important in, uh, in the dreaming, uh, in the content of dreaming and in the emotional aspects of sleep as well. And uh, through the, the sending pathways, there is also circadian regulation of uh, the rest of the system um, each of the systems ha having their own circadian uh, rhythmicity that is uh, governed uh, by, center by the central nervous system. So the sucroprachiasmatic nucleus, essentially, it, it helps promote arousal and, and maintains a state of, awake, uh, of wakefulness, typically during the day uh, and at night. Uh, this suprachiasmatic nu uh, nucleus is attenuate, attenuated and allows sleep to occur, allows the VLPO to flip the switch, uh, turn the lights off, and then you go to sleep. Uh, aside from light and melatonin, uh, eating patterns, uh, social interactions are, are also important side givers that help us uh, regulate uh, our clock. Um, some of you have uh, probably tra traveled maybe five, six, those of you have, to have traveled more than five or six time zones know that um, not just the sleep onset and when you feel sleepy change, but also the times that you get hungry even the times that you poop, you start saying, why am I pooping at unusual times? And, and the, the, the gastrointestinal system has their own circadian uh, regulatory system, which communicates uh, directly with the CNS. The slide I wanted to just kind of show you what the main neurotransmitters and anatomical substrates uh, involve in modulation of sleep. Uh, the lateral dorsal tegmental and the pedunculopontine uh, nucleus in the pons uh, produce acetylcholine and, and they are both uh, responsible through the reticular activating system for promotion of wakefulness, but they're also uh, very uh, involved in the stabilization and the production of REM sleep. The REM of neurons are, are, are there and, and, are, uh, and they use acetylcholine as their uh, messenger. Uh, this is important to know when, when we see patients with, with Alzheimer's disease that are in cholinesterase uh, uh, inhibitors that, that have uh, complaints of vivid dreaming, that, that is the basis for this. Um, and then we have uh, also uh, dopamine in the substantia nigra is uh, also involved both uh, in promotion of wakefulness as well as uh, stabilization of REM more involved in the REM off uh, part of the Ramonov uh, switch that we that I'll talk about in a couple of, of, of slides. Uh, the tuberomamillary nucleus is the source of production of histamine, which we know is a wake promoting substance, and that's the basis for why anti antihistamines uh, cause uh, sleepiness. And the the uh, uh, 
Posterior uh, hypothalamus produces orexin, and orexin um, is a, a molecule that's very important in wake promotion, uh, but it's also quite active in stabilization of sleep in ways that we are starting to understand. The, the, the interesting thing about orexin, the, the other name for it is hypocretin. Those of you who know uh, narcolepsy, people that have narcolepsy type one um, have uh, orexin uh, deficiency is a, a criteria for diagnosis. You can even check uh, levels of orexin in the spinal fluid. Uh, uh, that's one criteria for diagnosis of narcolepsy type one. And, and is why uh, is the basis of understanding the, the, the symptoms of, of cataplexy, of REM intrusion during the day, of sleep fragmentation that happens in narcolepsy and cataplexy, which is essentially a, 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 an unstable sleep, uh, not just from wake to uh, sleep, but also from REM on and off and intrusion of REM in the, in, at the wrong times. Um, so keep, keep uh, your, um, remember this, because this is, um, increasingly going to be a source of, of therapeutic, uh, uh, it's gonna be a therapeutic target. There are medications in the pipeline uh, or, or exing, uh, agonist for the treatment of, of narcolepsy type one, which might be seen later this year. Um, and uh, this is just another slide to illustrate what I just said, but as you see, orexing uh, in the, produced by the hypothalamus serves to stabilize all these other structures that we talked about the pontine nucleus, the locus ceruleus, uh, the dorsal rafe, all, all uh, structures that are involved uh, with a very complex system of redundant feedback loops. Um, that, that, that are, these are, that anorexia essentially has a stabilizing influence uh, on all of these structures. When we are awake, primarily uh, the neurotransmitter that's more active is essentially the choline, as I mentioned, through the reticular activating uh, system projecting into the basal forebrain and the rest of the uh, cortex uh, result in the, it's, uh, it's helped by other uh, neurotransmitters that also cause activation of the cerebral cortex, which I listed there, dopamine, histamine, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, and, and orexin, as uh, we uh, discussed. As we are falling asleep, we uh, uh, have less uh, of, of an in, of a excitatory and more of an inhibitory uh, influence from the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus uh, in conjunction with the L VLPO, attenuating the reticular uh, formation and its projection of fibers through the thalamus and through the rest of the cortex, uh, pro helping promote uh, sleep. This is to uh, expand on what I said about the sleep-wake switch, but essentially is a relationship between the tuberomamillary nucleus, which is a wake promoter, and the VLPO, which is a sleep promoter, and you have the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus, which is basically, it has two gates, which the, he, it opens and closes to allow either the TMN or the VLPO to take over, depending if you want to be awake or you want to be asleep. Um, so you see that, uh, on, on, on when we are uh, when we are awake, uh, then the, the TMN uh, predominates and, and and has inhibitory uh, effect on the VLPO and vice versa, and the opposite occurs when we are asleep. And this is another illustration for you to have a, a better understanding of the concept of the flip flop switch, uh, where we see in the awake uh, state and norepinephrine. Uh, uh, histamine uh, uh, and, the, and other activating, uh, stimulating uh, neurotransmitter are more active uh, with hypocretin uh, causing stabilization. And then we have melatonin and, and, and GABA uh, that at night predominate. Um, and this flip-flop switch goes back and forth. Uh, but with the, uh, with the uh, influence of the structures and the mechanisms I, I just discussed, this, I'm not gonna go into detail into this very complicated uh, slide, but this is just so you can have an idea of how complex and redundant all these mechanisms are and why it is so difficult uh, when you, you have patients that have uh, problems with insomnia, why sleeping pills may have uh, typically work for a short period of time, but stop working because there's about four or five 
uh, or more different neurotransmitter systems and feedback loops. So all these sleeping pills will, will target one neurotransmitter, but will keep many others um, uh, with, that, are, that are not being addressed. And that's why uh, we, we really don't uh, have good success with pharmacologic treatment of long-term insomnia. Uh, uh, Short-term insomnia is a different thing. There's also a switch or, or a ping pong back and forth uh, between uh, going into REM and going out of REM. Um, we have the uh, uh, PPT and uh, uh, produces acetylcholine and that's where the REM on neurons are. Um, as we uh, em emerge from REM sleep, we uh, have the RAFE and the locus uh, ceruleus, uh, which uh, will act and uh, turn off REM and continue either the cycle if it's early in the night or uh, eventually wakefulness. There's some, some, there's another uh, slide to uh, show the different uh, connections between the BLPO, the tuberomamillary nucleus and the basal uh, for, forebrain uh, during, sorry about that. Okay, so, so you see that there's more of an inhibitory, uh, inhibitory influence from the sleep uh, structures uh, into the thalamus and into the cortex. Uh, and, uh, it, it, and there is uh, excitatory stimulation of the sleep nuclei, uh, which are uh, producing uh, non-REM sleep. During REM sleep, we see uh, that uh, as things like acetylcholine, which I mentioned were active during wake, but also during sleep, we see uh, that there's gonna be a cholinergic stimulation of the cortex via uh, thalamocortical as well as basal forebrain uh, connections. And this is uh, useful to understand where dreams come for, from, how, how the cortex uh, is involved. So now that we talked about sleep and the, the, the CNS mechanisms of sleep and what normal sleep is, um, I'm gonna talk a, a, a little bit about some uh, things that, that change uh, uh, physiologically, uh, the, the activities that decrease when we are asleep include heart rate, uh, uh, cardiac output and blood pressure. It's what we call nocturnal dipping uh, in, in, in conditions that, uh, in conditions where sleep is disturbed, disturbed, you will not see that typical nocturnal dipping and that has pathological uh, implications. Our swallowing rate and salivary production decrease and so does uh, gastrointestinal mobility. Uh, our GFR decreases, uh, cortisol and insulin secretion decrease, important concepts to uh, understand the insulin resistance that happens in patients with obstructive sleep apnea and sleep deprivation. Um, and then in the uh, autonomic uh, nervous system, we see that there is a decrease in uh, sympathetic activity in muscle tone. Uh, there's a drop in core body temperature, uh, as well as uh, our metabolic rate, particularly during uh, REM sleep. We uh, have an increase, uh, relatively speaking, of parasympathetic activity while we are asleep and a drop in sympathetic activity. Uh, we have a five to seven um, uh, millimeters of mercury rise in the uh, CO2, in the arterial CO2 uh, concentration. And we have increasing antidiuretic anti hormone and testosterone. Uh, which are important to understand the nocturia uh, associated with obstructive sleep apnea, uh, the uh, testosterone deficiency that can happen in patients with obstructive sleep apnea and sleep deprivation in general, and an importance particularly for children, uh, and also, of course, for systemic repair in adults, uh, we have a, 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 an increase in growth hormones in addition to prolactin and renin increases. Now, I just... Uh, I wanted to show this slide before I, I, I started with the systemic thing, just to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a breather. Uh, this is a, uh, a painting by, by Salvador Dali. Um, you see it's a dream caused by, by the flight of a bee around a programmary one second before awakening. As you can see, it's a, a rifle with a bayonet uh, pointing to, to her face. This woman is gonna be awake uh, uh, in a second. Um, it's got two tigers, one of them coming out of the mouth of a, of a of a rockfish uh, that's coming out of a pomegranate. Uh, anyway, uh, I just found this interesting. So famous patient is, uh, is in Madrid in the Tizen Bortemisa, if you wanna go visit. Um, 
So what about dream? So I'm not going to talk a lot about dream because dream is more of a uh, cocktail party uh, philosophical discussion. And there's a lot we don't know about, about sleep, about dreams and, and the clinical imp implications. Right now, we, 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 you know, it's interesting that you go to sleep meetings and, and there's not, not a lot of lectures on, on dreaming. Uh, I guess you go to psychiatrists and they might, might have 90% of, of lectures on dreaming and, and people laying on couches. Uh, to analyze them. But uh, essentially, you know, there's mental activity during sleep that involves complex temporally unfolding uh, hallucinatory episodes, um, mostly visual, uh, things like flying and, and they're, they're possible. Uh, the loss of physics are broken. It's always first third person uh, where self is at the center. Uh, they predominate during REM, but non-REM sleep have been have been uh, uh, described. The problem is that it's, it's harder to arouse somebody from slow wave sleep. So we call timing and all that. So there's very little what we know about non-REM uh, dreaming, but it does uh, occur during uh, dream. And there are uh, theories that the dreaming during non-REM versus REM may have certain uh, specific functions in terms of uh, consolidation of specific types of, of memory uh, having implications for cognitive function. Um, the role is really unknown. Is it a byproduct of what's happening in the, in the brain? Uh, or is it a process of pruning and consolidation of memory? Or is it something more? You know, I think that, I think that the uh, dreams is an, is an extremely interesting subject uh, because if you think about it, is the neurochemical conversion to, to an image in, in an involuntary way. So it has all sorts to me that I, I, I can talk forever about dreams, but it has all sorts of ontological and philosophical uh, connotations. Uh, but that's, that's something in a, in a bourbon, bourbon infused uh, bonfire. It's a good topic for conversation. You have a question? Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's been, it's been, po I mean, you, 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 sometimes you have a task in a day and, and, and you're stumped and you don't know the solution and you get a good night's sleep and the next morning you, you wake up refreshed and, and, and ready to tackle. I, I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot that, that goes on in terms of, of that. Mostly, I, I would say that our dream contents from where we know about dreams is based on our experiences. So it's not, not based on what we don't, don't know. So, um, but anyway, obviously, you know, things like flying and, and time and space, they, they, the, 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 the borders of that are, are, are lost when we dream. But there's a lot more. It's a, it's a very fascinating topic, not, not because of what we know about it, but because of what we do not know. And that, by the way, this is, I, I don't know, you read, uh, whoever, uh, you're a Shakespeare fan, this is, uh, just an illustration of Queen Mab. Uh, Queen Mab was a little cricket that had a, a, a carriage. It was present in one of, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Mercutio's uh, dream uh, in uh, William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. But you should read that. I, I, actually, Shakespeare has all sorts of, uh, of, uh, of, of quotes about sleep that are, that are just really, really interesting. So during sleep, uh, we... Um, our respiration, uh, the, the, the control is determined by our metabolic demand. Um, anybody ha who has been in the ICU and seen pretty sick asleep people can, 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 can see uh, the disturbances in, in, in cardiopulmonary function that this can happen, that this can cause. Uh, the respiratory drive is, is, uh, has a central respiratory generation. There are changes in the uh, tone of pharyngeal muscle dilator tone. Uh, which lead to increased uh, upper airway resistance and collapsibility, obviously uh, relevant to the understanding of obstructive sleep apnea. The respiratory uh, muscles are in a, a state of relative hypothonia. Um, the, the, uh, there is uh, alteration of the ventilatory uh, control. We don't have the voluntary influence from the cortex, uh, which we have while we are awake. Uh, during uh, a respiration. We can hold our breath during the day. We can breathe more rapidly. We can uh, uh, breathe deep. Uh, we can't do those uh, things um, consciously while we are asleep, of course. 
we are going to see a progressive reduction um, as we progress through deeper uh, stages of sleep. Uh, as I mentioned, the carbon dioxide increases by three to seven millimeters of mercury. The uh, non-REM uh, respiration is uh, typically regular and under metabolic control, but as we go into REM sleep, it becomes more irregular. It's more dependent on behavioral factors. We go back to the influence of the, of the dreams and the imagery, which could, uh, through uh, hypothalamic and limbic structure, uh, affect uh, our, our breathing patterns because of what we are emotionally experienced during dreaming and, and REM. And this is why we typically we see when we do sleep studies some patients that have sleep related breathing disorder obstructive sleep apnea we split it between a, 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 a overall score or non-REM score and a REM score and we almost always see that patients with sleep apnea have worsening of uh, their sleep apnea significantly so during REM sleep because of this and and we have a reduction of uh, hypoxic and hypercapnic uh, responses um, and, and, and uh, on transition from wakefulness to non-REM sleep, and so one more uh, during uh, REM sleep as well. These are the uh, important uh, structures uh, just to, uh, so you have, can have an anatomical idea of, 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 of certain lesions at certain levels will cause certain uh, issues with uh, respiration, um, thalamic lesions, diencephalic lesions, lesions typically or involvement of, of any kind pathologically or, or by direct destruction or, or, or neoplasm or, or infarction can cause change those respiration. Uh, in the midbrain lesions uh, or pathology there will lead to hyperventilation. Um, the amnustic sense centers are in the rostral pons. Um, importantly because we see sometimes even penetrating uh, infarctions of the pons that could cause uh, crural deficits and, and uh, extraocular muscle uh, findings on those patients. I, I always ask, uh, or, or I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the possibility that they might have a central sleep apnea. We have um, patients with multiple sclerosis uh, can, can also uh, develop central sleep apnea because of uh, medullary, uh, I'm sorry, pontine uh, involvement of the amnustic centers from the myelinating lesions. Cardiovascular system uh, uh, also uh, has an intrinsic uh, relationship with uh, the CNS central, uh, the central sleep uh, control centers. The, the, at night, uh, the cardiovascular system is dominated by parasympathetic activity, as we have already alluded to. There's an increase in vagal activity, uh, which uh, reduces the risk of arrhythmia. And this is the basis for understanding all sorts of arrhythmias that happen on people that have disrupted sleep including atrial fibrillation. Um, and then we have heart rate, blood pressure, stroke volume, cardiac output, and systemic vascular re uh, resistance, all decrease with this phenomenon that we call nocturnal dipping. There is a transient increase of 35% heart rate when we go into phasic REM sleep, also showing uh, how REM sleep is a more active uh, state of sleep is kind of a, what we call paradoxical sleep. We have an increased autonomic nervous system activity uh, during REM sleep that could uh, lead to ventricular uh, arrhythmias uh, if disrupted. There's a, a, a very um, important relationship between normal sleep and normal metabolism. Um, typically there are uh, uh, substances such as leptin, uh, girling, uh, that are produced um, uh, insulin uh, also uh, that are, are produced uh, during, uh, during uh, sleep and disruptive sleep will lead to reduced levels of these uh, substances which can promote uh, obesity, uh, promote weight gain. And uh, also we have a, a state of, of decreased insulin sensitivity or increased insulin resistance uh, we get when we have disruptive sleep and uh, when that's, that's important to know because uh, when we see patients with diabetes, uh, every single patient that you see with diabetes, if they haven't had their sleep looked at, if they haven't been uh, evaluated for obstructive sleep apnea, they should. Because correction of obstructive uh, sleep apnea will lead to improvement 
of uh, glycemic indicators. These are some things that happen with different uh, or hormonal systems. So we, with the, on, on the left, there's two sides, two, two uh, rectangles. On the left, you see uh, somebody who goes through wake, wake, sleep, wake, and somebody who's awake the whole time for a 24 hour period. And we see the dipping of the temperature as we go to sleep. That's important. Actually, that's a circadian uh, indicator to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the VLPL to promote sleep onset. Um, we see that typically cortisol with, will dip leading to the uh, 8 a.m. 8 uh, notorious cortisol uh, peak. We have a decrease in urine volume um, by a suppression of antidiuretic hormone. So it's the disruptive sleep will result in uh, this not happening and therefore people with obstructive sleep apnea, I see it all the time, they, they, they have obstructive sleep apnea, they have to go urinate three, four times a night, you treat them for sleep apnea and the nocturia uh, very often goes away as well. Um, something important to, to know. Uh, the, the, the thyroid also has a peak right before uh, sleep and then continues to drop as the night goes on, but you see a more uh, prolonged, consistent rise on TSH on, on situations uh, where you have a constant routine where you're awake uh, all the time. Uh, important again for, for children and for repair is the fact that there's a spike in growth hormone uh, at the onset of sleep uh, that doesn't happen at all. It's a big difference. Uh, if we don't sleep, we, we really lose uh, our, our growth hormone production opportunity. Um, and then all, there are also uh, other more minor uh, changes that happen to prolactin, uh, PTAs and our wrist uh, activity uh, with uh, constant uh, wake state versus uh, entrained uh, sleep. So um, another uh, slide to, to illustrate the temperature control by the autonomic uh, nervous system, uh, which is uh, governed by the, chiasma the, supra the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the pineal gland, production of melatonin, which rises at night, and we see uh, an oxygen, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, temper, a cold body temperature uh, nadir uh, by the middle of the night. And then the temperature starts uh, rising up to diurnal patterns. And that we believe that between that and light uh, coming in, those are side givers to uh, promote a wealth, wakefulness and help us start, start the day. Remember that the gastrointestinal system has its own uh, circadian uh, rhythm and it has to be aligned with our central nervous system. So uh, there's been all sorts of associations between increased risk of certain malignancies, uh, hepatitis, uh, including non-alcoholic uh, hepatitis and other digestive issues that have been associated with uh, issues of circadian uh, misalignment. Important to uh, understand, I mean, it goes without, uh, without saying that the less we sleep, the more susceptible we are to disease. And of course, normal sleep is important for proper uh, immunity. Uh, there are pro-sleep, pro-inflammatory cytokine, cytokines that predominate during sleep. Those are uh, interleukin-1 uh, beta and tumor necrosis alpha. Uh, and there are anti-sleep or anti-inflammatory cytokines uh, that decrease the amount of sleep in, sleepiness and those are interleukin four uh, and 10. Um, and uh, it, the, the effect is bi-directional. If you have uh, some type of immune process uh, and you have some type of immune in, in, activation, you could see uh, by mediation of abnormal interleukin production that you're going to get disturbed sleep and fatigue. And the opposite is, is true as well. You get uh, immune dysregulation uh, when you have insufficient or uh, disturbed uh, sleep. So in conclusion, um, sleep, as we talked about, is a natural reversible state of perceptual disengagement. Um, remember, there is a great deal of redundancies of sleep-wake and REM on and off uh, networks, which is why sleep pharmacology is, is so complicated. Um, our normal sleep depends on proper functions of the sleep networks that we uh, discuss and the neurotransmitters that uh, modulate these. Total reported sleep drops with age, more than sleep requirements. Normal sleep is, is uh, as 
we showed is, is essential for normal systemic physiology and systemic functions are influenced by central circadian and other centrals uh, controlling specific stages of sleep. And that's all I have. And so, thank you. If you notice this, I, I just want to make a comment on that, but uh, I don't want to change the pants, so I can get to tell you that now. But this is a, what, what, what I, I, I put a quote from Julius Caesar there, if you see. But the picture, if you know Shakespeare, you know Shakespeare that's actually Lady Macbeth. And that's uh, King Duncan. And you can tell by the crown, by this, uh, the, the side of, her, of, his, uh, of his night table. Because you can see the hallway, there's Macbeth just plotting with Lady Macbeth down the hallway. Anyway. For those of us who do night shifts, uh, I mean, just like any cell phone device, it looks like when we travel and, and cross five, uh, so um, you can adjust to the situation. So for those who are doing like one night shift, a lot, there and yeah. I mean, you, you're going to have a, a, a rough a couple of days, um, but if you don't, don't do it consistently, you won't uh, fall into a pattern where there's going to be uh, a persistent changing environmental patterns or, or timings of onset of melatonin. If you start doing it consistently, then you start seeing more, more problem. I, there, there is a specific circadian rhythm disorder that's called shift work uh, disorder, which uh, every resident has. I had it. I'm sure you, some of you guys have it. But it usually it takes about an hour. An hour, you know, if you go, if it's six time zones to get fully acclimatized, then, then it's usually six days. So it's about an hour a day. That's kind of the rough estimate, but some people are able to adapt much better than others. There's a lot of genetics that, that are involved in, in our ability to adapt to changes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hu human beings were wired uh, mostly for day sleep, but but there are there, there are specific genes that have been associated with those of us that are morning persons, those, those of us that are night owls. So I think I think the future of person in the future of personalized medicine will be able to analyze our genomes and and tell us you should be sleeping from ten to six. And then we try to work, you know, to think or, or get a job at that time or whatever. But uh, you know, in a 24/7 society, we we just see a lot of sleep disruption because of of shift work. It's a good question. I don't know, but 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 it's not the major majority. Uh, oh yes, it, it, it is, and, and and it, and it is genetically determined. Because, so. This is useful, and I think at some point, I mean, if I, if I, I, I think I'm a morning person, but and I'm, I'm, most people know from their patterns and their tendencies, you know, are they night owls? But I think personalized precision medicine at some point would be able to tell us, you know, are you by basic sleeper? You know, do you like a nap? I like my my ten minute power nap midday. Some people can't do it, but all right. Well, thank you. <laughs>